Так, уважаемые коллеги, дамы и господа. Ladies and gentlemen, so the second, the third uh, bell is ringing. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Sergei Markedonov. So we're starting today. So my name is Sergei Markedonov. I'm leading research fellow at the Euro-Atlantic Security Center of the MGIMO Un Institute for International Relations. I'm your moderator now at the second session. So we are moving from greater Eurasia to a limited notion of new Eurasia and we'll focus on the post-Soviet space and on the processes taking place there. Can we talk about the erosion of the post-Soviet praise? We, we c can witness it and an emergence of a conditional world of stability and instability or it's too early to bury the post-Soviet space because uh, we still are connected with our, our Soviet space and uh, uh, we appeal to our past, we revisit our past. So. We'll discuss uh, how the Eurasian integrational projects work here, how they uh, in are interconnected or not, whether the integration is possible or is it just a dream and everything is much more compi compi complicated and uh, much and will have a much tougher environment. So these are an area of issues we're going to discuss. Let me introduce our speakers, our panel panelists. Marat Shibutov, uh, Kazakhstan, member of the National Council of Public Confidence under the President of Kazakhstan. Evgeny Pregerman, Director of the Minsk Dialogue Council on International Relations, Belarus. Uh, my two colleagues from Gimor University, uh, Nikolai Silaev, Leading Research Fellow at the Center for Problems of the Caucasus and Regional Security of the Gimor Institute, and uh, Evgeny Minchinka, Director of the Center for Political Elite Studies. And our guest from uh, uh, Uzbekistan, Ulukbek Hassanov, professor at the University of World Economy and Diplomacy of Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Uzbekistan, Alexander Iskandarian, director of the Caucasus Institute in Yerevan. The last but not least, Andrei Yermalov, uh, philosopher and head of the Sofia Strategic Group from Ukraine. You can see. We have many flags present here, and uh, we can have many points of views and attitudes. What we need is just good argumentation and discussion. Let's stick to the uh, schedule and to our uh, time limits. So the time limit is uh, five, seven minutes, no more. So. You are not here to present the thesis or a big talk, just polemic issues that would give rise to discussion, to issues and questions. And later we may use our discussion uh, in writing our fundamental research papers. Uh, again, issues, uh, Q&I session, and maybe I as a moderator would be more active here, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So we have to uh, to end our discussion at 13.25, uh, because we have to stick to our schedule and to have lunch. And we can continue our discussion during a lunch break. Uh, of course, it's uh, more important and it's a more serious challenge. So now, without any monologues, I give floor to Marat Shibutov, member of the National Council of Public Confidence under the President of Kazakhstan. Thank you very much for the floor given to me. So I, I, I can see that uh, I should be very brief and tough at the same time. 
Yes, you're quite right here. I agree with you. So my main topic is as the topic of this session, both for the elites, governments, and the academic community, and for the population of the post-Soviet uh, countries, is the uh, this dilemma, this choice to get rid of uh, the uh, died horse, dead horse, because we are. Uh, we still st we stick to old stereotypes, biases that uh, do not allow us to move further. SEO is just a dead organization. It has uh, completed its objective. Uh, actually, the objectives were completed before this organization was created. Uh, as far as uh, CIS, it's also that organization and its uh, uh, main obstacle on the way of developing uh, post-Soviet Eurasian Economic Union. Post-Soviet space does not exist because many countries, uh, post-Soviet countries, have chosen a different way of development. We just talk about it uh, because some countries stick together, for, for example, Russia and Belarus, but uh, because their elites are of the older generation. For example, Kazakhstan, the average uh, population age is 30, uh, uh, Tajikistan 27, Russia, Belarus 40. That's uh, why it uh, gives rise to, no to nostalgia. But I'm absolutely sure that there is no post-Soviet space, common post-Soviet State, and we do not need to uh, try to revitalize it, to resuscitate it, if we want to um, develop a new kind of integration. Uh, uh, today we, are, we talked about uh, the interaction between uh, China and uh, 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 the uh, Central Asian countries, you know, the the volume of trade turnover is not that important. So we do not produce any technologies that would be in high demand in other countries and globally. That's why now we have to review and revise our approaches. For example, uh, we have uh, too many paper uh, accords and organizations, so now we have to understand that the only alive structure with the uh, potential of development is the Eurasian Economic Community of Union, and that would, should be the focus of the integration. But before we start this new kind of integration, we have to disintegrate with the old structures and vehicles. F for example, uh, the free trade zone of CIS countries. So when we get rid of all these obsolete standards organizations, then we'll be able to re-sign and re-conclude our treaties accords with Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Georgia and other countries. Then we can understand what we really need from them and what they need from us. And here I'd like to call on you to uh, measure statistically, to use uh, qualitative measurements, because we are just uh, use now Stalinist narrative or rhetorics about the uh, <coughs> friendly and fraternal people. The Soviet Union uh, is dead for more than 30 years, and we should forget about the past. So most say that we stick to, that we are political realists, so then let's be uh, realists in reality, not just uh, 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 in words, let's show it in deeds. Marat, thank you very much, uh, you just stuck to the schedule, so, so your 
presentation uh, is in the spirit of learning. Before we can get together, we have to disintegrate. Uh, and as Tolstoy also said, we have to uh, show what uh, people are in the end countries relations are in reality and for this we have to get rid of all disguises please give the microphone to the speaker please give the mic to the speaker okay you can uh, still get rid of your disguise and now i give the floor to yegeny prigerman um, our guest from minsk Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to make my personal contribution. And I would like to uh, wish Sergey a happy birthday. He thinks that his birthday is over because it was yesterday, but I believe it's continuing. And in the evening, you're not going to escape our celebration. So happy birthday. So now... Uh, Sergey asked us to be brief, but he also asked us to give some strategic assessment. So I'm going to share five thoughts, and I hope I'm going to stick to the time limit. So the first thought is the most ab abstract one and probably the most cliche one. So the territory that we believe to be a post-Soviet space, but it probably doesn't exist anymore, but geographically, let's call it a post-Soviet space, uh, it is now going through and it will keep going through the influence of uh, global context, uh, just as other regions uh, in the world. But I believe that um, we can feel the global character of everything, especially in the post-Soviet space, because uh, it touches upon many structures and organizations we have there. So what do I mean by the global context? I believe that this is uh, a stage of disintegration in the system of international relations. And uh, at some point in the future, we don't understand when, it's going to lead to a new critical uh, congregation and uh, this competition with centers in Washington and Beijing will structure everything else but we don't know how and that's important because here's my second conclusion so talking about post-Soviet space um, be independent from the global context, I believe it is also important to uh, use this conclusion in analytics because we often uh, directly describe structural factors influencing certain actors. And uh, we usually believe that structural factors uh, are something that directly uh, states uh, the only way of development for international relations for certain actors and for certain states. But I would say that uh, the foundation of everything is not the structure, but the national interest of a country that acts rationally and pragmatically and they had, have to react to a changing context. So I don't want to sound too abstract, so I'm going to give a little example. Recently, uh, there was an interview of a very interesting and famous Russian analyst, and his main point was that uh, the multilateral policy in the post-Soviet space died. And um, I've been following his work, and I, I remember that about five years ago, he published an article with almost the same um, name, it was called the end of uh, multifaceted approach. But his point of view today is quite the opposite. He said that we can see the end of a multilateral approach because Russia and the Soviet Union does not uh, have such conflict points and such issues that they are ready to fight over. So neither Russia nor the post-Soviet space countries are ready to fight. And five years ago, he had a different argument. He said that there was an escalation of tension. And so he made a conclusion that countries in the post-Soviet space, especially small countries, uh, will have to uh, put an end to multilateral policy uh, and the, their multi-vector nature. But we can still see this multi-vector nature. And these arguments don't work. I believe this is 
an example of a mistake where a starting point was uh, a structure rather than the national interest of countries. Uh, now getting to my third point. Uh, everything I said uh, will mean a certain ambivalence for the post-Soviet space, especially when it comes to the vision of uh, the strategic uh, steps in the future. So it's important that this ambivalence, this contradiction, will be set by the main and most important actor in this space, which is the Russian Federation. And the Russian Federation will uh, see the same behavior model uh, from other important actors, I mean outside actors that are important for the region, like the European Union, no matter uh, whether it's going to keep existing and no matter how it will exist in the next uh, 10 years or so. And uh, the main task will be to minimize risks and to maintain a broad uh, space for, uh, for acting in the future. As for my fourth thought, the ambivalence will be implemented through project cooperation. And the principle here is very easy. The simpler and the more tangible profit a certain actor can get. And by actors, I mean both states and companies. Um, so the easier this profit will be, uh, the um, easier uh, it will be to build cooperation. And political and ideological contradictions uh, will um, make this project cooperation harder, but they are not going to be an obstacle that is going to uh, prevent important projects from happening. Because all the actors will build their own let's call them puzzles of international relations based on geopolitical projects. And my final thought is that it doesn't mean that big ge ge geopolitical projects will stop existing. They will keep existing, but they will build infrastructure for project cooperation rather than dividing new Eurasia into separate blocks or geopolitical zones. And the most important thing, and the last thing I'm going to say, it's important to understand that these geopolitical projects will be almost impossible at the level of declarations. And uh, here I'm talking about the concept of integration. I believe a declaration will um, not be a part of the future political system. And uh, some of these ideas will not be implemented. Thank you very much. So we already have five thoughts from Pregerman, and maybe by the end of the conference we're going to have more. So thank you very much for sticking to the time limit, and I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, whose name is Nikolai Silaev. Uh, remember, your time limit is five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to focus on the place of post-Soviet space in Russian foreign policy. From the doctrinal point of view, everything is quite obvious. In all the doctrinal um, documents, uh, the post-Soviet space, aside from the Baltics, that's already not considered part of it, are a priority for Russia's foreign policy. But if we compare the resources and the efforts uh, in the post-Soviet space and the resources and the efforts uh, that are spent uh, uh, in other foreign countries, uh, it is hard to compare them. And for Russia, the relations with the US or with China uh, turn out to be much more important than with post-Soviet countries. And uh, I don't think there is a di direct link to this. But we can see that there is a real priority and there is a doctrinal priority. And uh, there is one more factor 
in foreign policy that has an influence on it. And we can especially see it after 2015, after what happened in Syria. It turned out that Russia, Russia's foreign policy is more effective in terms of acquiring the status of a great power and uh, it works better abroad rather than um, in the post-Soviet space. And uh, if we're talking about uh, Russia's status of great power as a resource, Russia is now gaining this resource somewhere else, in the Middle East, in its relations with China, in its relations with the United States, and in its relations with the European Union. But Russia spends its resource in the post-Soviet space because the ability to acquire this resource uh, th through of their foreign policy in the post-Soviet space is quite limited. And uh, I believe this was demonstrated by the last 10 years and uh, especially by the last five years. They show that certain political circles in Russia haven't dreamt about restoring their influence in the post-Soviet space, no matter what we mean specifically by it. And there are certain limitations for building up influence in the post-Soviet space. And I'm, I don't want to go into detail about what restrictions I see here, but I believe uh, we can see something quite evident. For example, uh, the things going on with Belarus now uh, confirm this thing once again. So what is the conclusion that can be made? We can conclude that in the post-Soviet space, we can see a new balance. Ten years ago and five years ago and even four years ago, we discussed uh, the showdown between Russia and the West in the post-Soviet space. Again, uh, no matter what we mean specifically by it. I believe now the intensity uh, of this fight has decreased because now we can see the limits of success of both sides in this region or in these regions to be more precise. On, on the one hand, even those countries who wanted to be part of the Euro-Atlantic security, they didn't manage to do it. And uh, of course, why they didn't manage uh, is a, a separate question and uh, we could see Russia's contribution into it. But on the other hand, Russia cannot achieve any significant success in post-Soviet integration. Therefore, the nerve of global politics that used to be in the post-Soviet space in the past uh, is no longer there. And now it opens up a very interesting opportunity. Now there's an opportunity to develop relations with post-Soviet neighbors, not in the context of geopolitics or balance of power or um, a big confrontation with somebody, but in the context of uh, neighborly cooperation. Look at how the internal political cri crisis was resolved in Moldova. Look at what's going on between Russia and Uzbekistan or Russia and Azerbaijan. If we're talking about these two cases, we can see integrational initiatives from both sides, but these initiatives don't imply institutional integration. We're talking about expanding trade and economic cooperation, but the sides do not assume any geopolitical obligations. And I believe that this um, cooperation of neighbors on some practical development issues will become the main trend in the post-Soviet space in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. As for uh, a neighborly partnership as a lever, as something that will drive uh, the state of affairs in the post-Soviet space. I believe it's very interesting. And uh, the cut slice 
uh, policy is interesting as well, but the question is whether they will want to do it. It is interesting when you build your identity through former relations. And now I give the floor to Ulugbek Hassanov from Uzbekistan. And we've already uh, mentioned Uzbekistan is a very important and positive player. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers of this important forum for inviting me. Um, for inviting me to speak here uh, in my alma mater, where I spent many of my student years and where I did my uh, PhD research. I would like to briefly talk about a very important thing. Talking about Great Eurasia, when uh, where one of the most important elements is Central Asia. And uh, we could see an initiative uh, from China, from Iran, from India, from Pakistan, from the Russian Federation uh, towards this uh, very big community. And we understand that without this region, uh, all their efforts will not have a positive outcome or such a positive outcome. So talking about uh, regional politics, uh, we were told in the lectures that any global power can only become global when it becomes regional. Russia is a global power because Russia is a Central Asian, Russia is a Middle Eastern, an African, and a Far Eastern, and an Asia-Pacific power. The same uh, goes for the United States or for China. We're talking about a new trend. It's a regional trend for global processes. And uh, here we need to say that regional actors and regional powers start playing a very important role in new political and economic relations. So I would like to draw your attention to three important elements of Central Asian relations. Today they are changing and they are undergoing very serious alterations. Uh, and uh, it's important that uh, regional players have a new vision towards each other. And uh, in November 2017, uh, the conference mentioned the role of Central Asia as the main vector of foreign policy of Uzbekistan. It has much sense, and it's a really a well uh, thought and elaborate approach because we are revising our relations, focusing on traditional relations, on traditional cooperation with our regional partners. For example, Tajikistan, first of all, signing a strategic partnership uh, with uh, Tajikistan. Uh, we also boost relations with the leaders of this country and with the Republic of Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzia. So our traditional relations have always been good with Kazakhstan. We still focus on them. We are making uh, them uh, uh, closer because in the past, uh, though Kazakhstan had uh, their own relations with Uzbekistan, but they were focused on other countries. They did not treat us as uh, serious investment partners. Now, Kazakh and Russian partners regard our region and especially as our state as an important uh, investment opportunity. That's why uh, the signed treaty on strategic partnership had been ratified as well by all these countries. In uh, uh, Tajikistan, uh, the same, uh, it has been ratified by Kyrgyzstan. Uh, why? Because uh, energy, uh, uh, transborder trade flows are very important with for us with Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzia, Kazakhstan. Uh, 
they are, are of primary importance for our country, for Uzbekistan. <laughs> For example, Ros Selmash did not position itself as a partner and investor uh, for Uzbekistan. And now uh, we are uh, uh, starting to develop this component uh, of SM. Uh, we are uh, involved in machine uh, assembly uh, in Uzbekistan. And also, uh, one of our partners in uh, metal and steel uh, industry is Uralmash. And we uh, start producing together some, some parts. And uh, they are building uh, steel uh, works in Uzbekistan. Uralmash, I mean Uralmash. So it means that we are developing developing industry together. We are not just trade partners. So our relations with Kazakhstan, with Russia, uh, in, uh, with Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan and Tajikistan in terms of trans-border cooperation uh, are acquiring new dimensions. In the past, we had some problems in terms of water resources. As you know, water distribution, water management. Now it is uh, sold very positively through the system of cooperation with our Tajik and Kyrgyz partners. We have some points of rapprochement and we, uh, our relations are no longer tense as they used to be. Uh, another important issue, we regard uh, Uzbekistan not as a flashpoint, but as a potential for the development, because Afghanistan is a very good for, uh, investment opportunity for the development of, um, for example, for development of uh, relations uh, and uh, ties. Uh, with some parts of Afghanistan uh, would be very beneficial. I mean the northern Afghanistan. And we are actively involved in this process. We are ready to make investments into Af Afghanistan. And uh, it will help to solve the problems uh, to meet challenges Afghanistan is, is facing. So, because we regard Afghanistan as uh, a format to the, or, or as a site to develop social and economic relations. So that's uh, uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about. Thank you very much. It's just an X-ray <coughs> test. You've just uh, showed us a case study, and uh, you've talked about very interesting aspects. When we talk about post-Soviet uh, space, usually the Central Asia is connected with the uh, Caucasus. But now, so uh, my, uh, the floor is given to Alexander Skandarian, director of the Caucasus Institute in Yerevan. Thank you very much. So uh, the, the question is if uh, there is life on Mars. Uh, so is there a post-Soviet space, common post-Soviet space? I'm not going to be that radical as they usually say. Uh, it depends, I'd say, it depends on the area, for example, geography. Of course, we do exist in geographical terms. Though it's just a manner of speech, which is not perceived critically. How can we 
uh, can talk about the geographical unity from Moldova to Kamchatka. It's very difficult. Of course, when we had just one country, the USSR, we could talk about that unity, but it was supported quite artificially. Let's move on to culture. Yes, there are some spheres, for example, uh, some salads, Olivier French salads where I used to. But still, we can see changes taking place in this area as well. So, there are some uh, cultural elements as the Soviet architecture, which can be seen even in the newly built uh, uh, houses. The uh, Russian language, which uh, is spoken by some elderly groups, but for example, if you go to Georgia, you can't speak uh, Russian there because they won't understand you there. So the situation is changing. And in a generation of the elites, post-Soviet elites, new people will come and they will speak through an interpreter. And that would mean that the situation would be absolutely different. If we talk about our profession, uh, if we discuss some political issues, for example, uh, typological regimes between Turkmenistan and Estonia, there is a huge difference. You just can't think about other greatest difference because they differ enormously. They are similar to uh, neighborly countries, of course. But sometimes we can look at neighborly countries and see, at countries that are neighbors, and see that they, they are also very different. Some are closer to the Czech Republic, some to Egypt, some to Latin America. So uh, we are... Uh, talking about the zone of conflicts and zone of developments or areas, I'd say that it's possible to develop uh, uh, against the background of a conflict, but we can have no conflict and no development. And so the development, as I s understand the Russian language, is, uh, has always uh, has, has, has always a positive connotation. But s sometimes we, we just used uh, uh, to perceive the development as a positive evolution, though there are might some negative developments. And I can tell you that our post-Soviet countries differ from each other now dramatically. Okay, so we can use uh, different terms here, but still, Tajikistan, uh, is it uh, uh, near abroad and Russia and Finland? Is it far from Russia? Why? So it's just uh, an absolute way of thinking. Uh, rather, I'd say it's rather outdated. But still, another question is whether we can develop integration. Of course. We should develop it, because the configuration of the states is now different. But it doesn't matter uh, whether they were part of the USSR or not. But uh, the uh, point is that the huge territory and huge geographical dimension is Russia puts it in a special position. And uh, it should develop integration with all its neighbors. And Sometimes uh, uh, they compare the neighborly countries with the Eurasian economic community, and I tell you that um, it's a bad comparison. You know, Russia is core, is a core. In uh, the Eurasian economic community, we can talk about, we can mention the German economy because it can be a core of integration. But still, Russia is such a specific country that it's really unique uh, because it's... Uh, it's really unique in terms of huge size, in terms of potential uh, 
uh, so this integration is uh, like uh, if you talk about neighbors countries neighborly countries neighbor countries they cannot integrate without Russia let's compare Armenia and uh, Russia. We can see that we can always mention Russia, Azerbaijan, Russia, Armenia, Russia, Ukraine. So we have this construct in the center, Russia. That's why we need integration with the help and through Russia, through working out uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, models. So if Russia will develop, if Russia develops integration with the Western countries, then it will not uh, take on board uh, post-Soviet space because they would uh, there would be different uh, uh, aspects, different models of development. So it depends uh, on the vector of integration. Okay, so thank you very much. You've just presented, represented Russia as a big integrator, uh, the main, the core magnet. But you know, sometimes uh, they say that we, as uh, um, they just stick to the principle of Russia is out and uh, it's, it can be compared to a uh, fable. Uh, I have not noticed an elephant. So if you want not to notice Russia, it's uh, absolutely possible. So if we stick to our geographical line, the Caucasus is uh, uh, fit into the uh, Black Sea area, though sometimes some uh, Caucasian republics do not have access to sea because they are lock, uh, uh, landlocked. And in this frame, they also mention Ukraine. That's why the floor is given to Andrei Yermolaev, head of the Sofia Strategic Group and philosopher. It's just uh, as a toast. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's um, really the first session was very interesting. I just um, wanted to make some comments, but uh, I, I realized that I'd uh, write a paper on uh, the topic. So, this space, we're discussing post Soviet space. Uh, uh, first, we mean social space. And uh, Gorbachev Fund organized uh, discussion post Soviet, Soviet homine, uh, human being, Homo Sovieticus. So the story, history of the 20th century showed three types of Homo Sovieticus. So that's the f period of the early Soviet state, uh, the repressive culture, and we know uh, all this, uh, the cost of all these reprisals and suppression, uh, what was the result in human terms of in industrialization and uh, uh, of the creation of collective farms. Then the, the second uh, model, uh, administrative capital, capitalism and a different time of uh, homo Soviet, sovieticus. And today, uh, what we can see, those who have this, uh, uh, those who know these uh, cultural codes and practices, uh, the salad of uh, Olivier, French salad, uh, and so on, um, they are dying out. They are becoming extinct. So we had the very close features, but when we had the, uh, the state system, now uh, we do not have a common state. The elites uh, divided the spy and uh, divided the territories, and now they created a new generation of million millionaires. These are our children that uh, were brought up by uh, in the conditions of uh, uh, trans uh, transnational corporations. So they sometimes were very uh, surprised by their uh, projects that uh, cannot be realized. In terms of the legacy, Soviet legacy, 
the post-Soviet society is dying out. For example, I'm talking about Ukraine. Uh, as we have an elder generation of leaders, this system is being preserved. But uh, at the same time, we are witnessing a change of generation, and so new people are coming, uh, young people are coming to uh, the power structures, and they have different views and attitudes. So we're, now we are discussing serious civilization uh, uh, problems when we uh, have not uh, passed a test on uh, uh, the level of humanity. Uh, and every, co every country has a frozen conflict. Uh, so just, and the uh, final drop is the war in Donbass, which shows the relations between states, between nations, and it was a test to post-Soviet elites to find new solutions that would uh, enable us to, f to settle uh, conflicts peacefully. And it shows that our elites are not mature and are not capable of uh, 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 holding a mature dialogue, but I'm not going to talk about war. Here, uh, people are present uh, from the Academia uh, of International Relations uh, Diplomacy, and we are talking about the building of new relations, of new diplomatic relations, and we've been witnessing these events for 20 years. But now we are witnessing the changes that can give us a unique historical chance, uh, uh, for example, the negotiations uh, um, in Paris. It's a chance that uh, can give to countries and strategic elites to uh, start new uh, strategic dialogue. What way? So now we can see a political crisis escalating. And uh, I hope that it will not escalate much further. But this is a test for us about how we can cope with this work, about how we can connect different projects with the current reality. And uh, now, after a change of power in Ukraine, I'm not only talking about the relations between Ukraine and Europe or Russia and Ukraine. I'm talking about all countries. They have an idea they have an opportunity to support the idea of the new process in our uh, continent. And uh, Ukraine was about uh, to be a new diplomat in our continent, but unfortunately it didn't happen. I understand that my time limit is over, but I w just want to say two conclusions that might be of interest to you. Uh, what we are going through now is the second transformation crisis. Uh, it's a crisis of the system, and it can be compared uh, to uh, the first crisis that uh, led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But unfortunately, the main characteristic of a transformational crisis is uh, the dissolution of economic and political institution and their deformation. And countries that have a mobilization model uh, experience this crisis in a softer manner. But countries that have political competition uh, face a upheavals and uh, major shocks. At the same time, we're going through restructuring of uh, old institutions. And uh, sometimes uh, the competition for elements of this uh, industrial system looks like an internal fight for resources. and. Uh, the industrial resource is bigger than the demand in production. Therefore, we can see the destruction of, uh, the, of a big part of old industry in Donbass. And when the war started, one of the people I know asked me, do you think this war in Donbass, aside from being a conflict, aside from uh, having to do with international relations, do you think it's an attempt to destroy uh, a very big 
powerful economic factor, uh, which is the Ukrainian industrial complex. It can also be considered as that. And maybe after a while, history books will write this. And in 30 years, some person from England or from Germany will say that agrarians won over the industrialists in this war. And now I'd like to conclude talking about the destruction and reorganization. I'm now following the discussion connected with the future of the Eurasian project. And I would like to point out that uh, we can see differences in approaches. The old version of reintegration that we could see in the Eurasian Economic Union is now converted to uh, what we call the Primakov model of Russia, China, and India. And uh, according to the position of our Indian colleagues, they do not regard it as the model of developing themselves in the continent. They just see themselves as a partnership. Uh, they just see themselves as a partner in this alliance with China. But in any case, it really reminds uh, me something that will not form the new Eurasia, but will form the alliance that is now contradictory and confrontational towards Europe. And uh, one thing that seems quite appealing is the uh, the idea of a great continent that can unite big infrastructure projects of China, Russia, uh, who now uses uh, its communication opportunities and its resources, uh, and Europe. It is quite a different approach that would really allow to find a formula that would be discussed not only in the Eurasian Economic Union, but that would also be discussed in the platform of cooperation between Russia and Europe, between Russia and Central Europe. This would be a great opportunity to uh, create a model of cooperation in the whole continent. And uh, there were many wars and conflicts, like the Karabakh conflict, the conflict in Transnistria, and uh, taking into account the discussion that is now aimed at bridging the differences between Europe and Asia, we really need the idea of new Europe, Eurasian thinking. And then it's not going to be China and Russia against the West. Uh, I believe this is uh, quite a questionable idea, actually. It would be great if we had a continental bloc, it, if it included uh, Moscow, Beijing, and Europe, and it would solve the problems of the countries that uh, unfortunately are now the pawns of politics, like Ukraine. And I believe that the discussion of new continental thinking would be very interesting, uh, rather than dividing the continent into two parts, because I believe that's very old-fashioned and looks very Cold War-ish. Thank you very much for your contribution. And... Uh, I believe that it's a very important thought that we need to write down and discuss further. And uh, maybe we could write an article about it. But the only thing I'd like to say, uh, that you mentioned a very creative idea about the new continental order. And it's a great idea. And uh, I would definitely vote for this idea. But it's important to bear one thing in mind. Every world order, uh, every idea has an author. And uh, these authors, these people, have certain interests. So we'll keep this in mind, too. This is important. But you need to understand that everything that diplomats say and everything that international relations experts say uh, has to deal with the security of this order. All right, so now let's move on to the next report. OK, uh, so uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, so we'll have some time for further discussions later. And now I give the floor to Yevgeny Menchenko. Um, last but not least, um, please stick to the time limit. Because I've been quite liberal because we have guests from Ukraine. And I want everyone to know that MGMO and Russian academic space gives, gives every point of view a right to be heard if they're constructed. Uh, well, uh, the remarks could take less time, too. 
uh, Maharaj Bhutov offered us to take a new approach. But the problem is that um, he offered the metaphor of a dead horse, but we don't have one dead horse. We have many dead horses. We live in a unique crisis uh, of uh, rhetoric and of narrative. And I'm very happy that um, I'm the last to speak because the things that were discussed here uh, and every speaker uh, could uh, could uh, see the differences. There is a great gap between the language and reality. We just can't find uh, how, uh, the, bri the bridge, how to fill in the gap. Do you remember this story about an elephant in a dark room and uh, the description uh, was uh, absolutely different of its different parts uh, and <coughs> the nature of elephant didn't become easier to grasp, to understand when it's described in a dark room. The same happens here. Yes, we uh, see the crisis of new, uh, of the old narrative, but we can also witness a crisis of new globalist narrative. Uh, do we, we remember the optimists of the first uh, Ukrainian Maidan because uh, they uh, helped to reach, uh, to build a democracy, to reach a, a city on a hill, as it was described by Fukuyama. But now we see that uh, all these uh, points are getting um, obsolete or even just are crumbling down. And uh, we can see the crisis of this new ideological or of this new ideological order. The same uh, can be said about the Russian opposition. Now, uh, now they're saying we are different people, we are sort of aliens, we have a different men mentality. But who are they vis-a-vis -vis in Ukraine? Uh, new race in Ukraine, just the fighters uh, from the uh, battalions, neo-Nazi battalions that can do anything they wish uh, with the uh, uh, residents, uh, people living in Donbass. So you see, we can still uh, feel this uh, attraction of the West. I just made, uh, held a short survey in my channel. So, uh, the President of Russia 2024, whom should he resemble, uh, resemble of what leaders of the 21st uh, century? It was Lee Kuan Yew. And if uh, we take the current political leaders, then the answer was, do, do you have any ideas? Trump, the third place, and the, the first place, Xi Jinping, China. So there is an attraction of the Asian authoritarianism, though this trend is also going down, because if we look into the elites of the post-Soviet countries, they feel uh, some disappointment uh, with in the cooperation with China. Uh, as w now we are talking about Russia's pivot to East, but those countries have done it earlier, and now they feel a little bit disappointed. Now, uh, the uh, language of national egoism is becoming more dominant in the world, which is quite extensively used by Donald Trump and Modi, for example, and China as well. So big global projects, uh, but uh, they serve national egoism. Maybe we should uh, have the same attitude. We should become more egoistic. We should uh, proclaim our own interests and sometimes we have problems here because sometimes we do not know what we really want and national elites sometimes do not know. Also, a problem is the generation gap. 
inside the country, between the countries, as they uh, have already, uh, as has already been mentioned today, that there is an older elites uh, in the post-Soviet countries and younger elites coming to power. Uh, for example, in Moldova, Moldova, Ukraine, and possibly Belarus. Uh, and we have this uh, Russian language de-ideology de 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 space with the domination of very simple things as uh, uh, films, simple films uh, and uh, uh, bloggers. Um, so I think that we should work with these leaders in the informational space because the retention of the Russian language in their uh, informational space is uh, uh, the interest of this country. So uh, 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 the countries tell us, please, uh, could you teach Russian? Because you'll be able to sell it uh, at a big market because it should be in our interest but it's also very important to build new communication platforms and uh, there are Russian platforms like Odnoklasniki VK.com and Telegram um, which is now developing in the post-Soviet space um, even uh, the center for Euro-Atlantic security has their Telegram channel now there is a problem of new technology and new political communication methods that post-Soviet space uh, countries usually do not correspond to and cannot use. Uh, now there is a big education project for Russian elites, but I believe that if we want to respond to new challenges, one of the things is joint education of the future political elite. and. Uh, developing ties between them. For example, in Russia, there is a school of future governors, and I believe it would be correct to invite people from post-Soviet space there, because there is a demand. Uh, for example, we have representatives um, of uh, post-Soviet countries at almost all the conferences, especially from Kazakhstan. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that now there is an anti-establishment wave everywhere around the world. And uh, somewhere we can see it was manifested in color revolutions in other countries like Russia and Kazakhstan. We can also see this demand and traditional leaders, uh, a traditional uh, governor now yields its space to a person people can relate to. Now we can still see that in some countries uh, comedians become presidents and they can't really solve problems. But I believe that in the future we are going to need the sort of person who will be able to use new technology and uh, offer new ways of solving problems. And I believe that the key thing is to raise these new uh, technological geniuses. And uh, I'm not only talking about the economy, but I'm also talking about soft skills, uh, both in uh, international relations and with people in general. And I believe we need a new style of diplomatic language as well. I understand that it's a very conservative field, but we need a new style of uh, communication and international relations. We need to match the new trends. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Now we are quite good with the time limit, and now we're going to have a question and answer session. Maybe uh, you have some comments or remarks or questions. I can see that Marat has a question. I have a little remark. I want to add something to what Nikolai Selaev was saying. So, for example, in the global context, uh, like uh, in Syria, uh, 
uh, Russia uses uh, its intelligent forces and special operation forces. It has its military advisors there. That is a typical uh, kit. Uh, of uh, a superpower. But when it comes to post-Soviet space, uh, it's not the Russian Federation. It's still the Russian Republic of the Soviet Union, uh, where the leading roles are taken by different clans or diasporas or uh, the archives of the Minsk KGB. They still play an important role. And these factors technically should be outdated, but we can still see this. So Russia is one country when it comes to um, international relations in other countries. But when Russia is in the post-Soviet space, it acts completely differently. And I believe that Russia has to deal with this problem and uh, post-Soviet countries as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Nikolai, would you like to give a comment? Uh, hopefully, we're not going to use special forces in the post-Soviet space. If you don't have any questions or comments or remarks, uh, then we're going to have the next question. Uh, let's start the question and answer session officially now. I uh, have three questions. Uh, please address this question to someone specifically if you want to ask one. And after three questions, we are going to move on to answers. Uh, if I may, can I give a small remark to what Marat said? Uh, and I'm not joking here. In the post-Soviet space, Russia is also represented by Yandex, by Mail.ru, by Odnoklasniki, VK, and other platforms. We are not only seen as a Russian Republic of the Soviet Union, but I understand what you're talking about. I'm talking about political relations. And... Uh, all these platforms like VK, they don't work in politics. In politics, we still have papers uh, dating back to the Soviet Union. Well, let's not name names here. Uh, of course, uh, there is also a bunch of uh, uh, translations and other bureaucracy. So Eleonora has the first question. Please introduce yourself and ask your question from the Italian Institute uh, for Political Studies. Um, I have a small remark um, following up on um, Professor Minchenko's um, remark on, on uh, leaders uh, and obviously the reference um, to uh, Zelensky in Ukraine. So I have to say that the uh, tendency to choose the leaders that are outsiders to politics is not something that is specific to the post-Soviet space. In fact, it's kind of a global um, phenomenon yes, and in, in Italy as well and uh, well look at the US etc but um, that's why I think um, it is important to uh, invest on uh, rather than focusing only on leaders on um, the community of, of foreign policy professionals uh, that surrounds the leader and help him get the uh, the right um, foreign policy priorities. This was something that we were discussing this morning with uh, Yevgeny. And um, I very much appreciate the type of uh, programs that you suggested with regards to leader formation, but um, maybe the key is to invest on, on, on a broader community of foreign policy um, professionals. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe you want to make a comment as well. Good afternoon. My name is Iqbal Guliev. I'm Vice Director of the International Institute of Energy Policy at Mgimor University. I'm not a political scientist by profession, but I want to give a comment about the speeches that we have heard today, and mostly I'm talking about Mr. Salaev's speech and Mr. Hassanov's speech. I really love the idea of Mr. Salaev that now one of the main trends is neighborly cooperation on practical issues. And uh, you were saying that there are relations between Russia and Uzbekistan and Russia and Azerbaijan. Then Mr. Hasanov was talking about Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and so on and so forth. And in all these forms of bilateral relations, uh, energy plays a very important role. 
And uh, for me, it just proves once again that nowadays um, energy and uh, cooperation in energy is a driver of regional cooperation in the post-Soviet space. So we shouldn't forget about it. Mr. Skandaran said um, something that made me draw uh, this on a piece of paper. And uh, on top, you can see Russia there. And then you can see other countries. And we mustn't forget that uh, there can be different triangles and rectangles without Russia. So we should also take this into account. And uh, continuing your thought on development, uh, developing what we have in the post-Soviet space, we don't, we don't only have positive development, we also have negative development, like the, there is a development of different diseases and other negative things, but we mustn't allow this development to dominate. Mumbai University, uh, I have a, a question to all who have presented uh, their uh, presentation in this uh, uh, session. Uh, particularly you, Evgeny. Uh, does Russia use soft power, its uh, policy uh, towards the former uh, or uh, former Soviet republics in its foreign policy? First. Second, that's uh, Marat uh, Skazar is uh, uh, on his Kazakhstan. Uh, do we still use uh, Kazakhstan and Central Asia? Kazakhstan is Sredne Asia, at least Central Asia, whatever you may call it. Do we uh, use? But uh, during our student days, it was used that term in. But unfortunately, what, uh, not unfortunately, but uh, in Kazakhstan, it is said that no, uh, this is not Central Asia, we are not part of Central Asia, we are just Kazakhstan is a separate identity, and Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Is this still alive, or uh, do we feel that we are not part of Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Central Asia? And one uh, small remarks about this, when this uh, three countries, Russia, uh, India, and China, these are three, they use, they, they are, uh, maybe their ego play a very ego and uh, nationalist uh, mind play a vital role in the foreign policy. Yes, as far as India is uh, concerned, yes, uh, I feel that uh, our uh, current Prime Minister and its uh, party use that nationalist policy and you heard that uh, uh, last uh, in last week what had happened in our country uh, and still a uh, long way to go. And because there is no opposition, and still we have to face these problems. Спасибо большое, так Евгений. Но вам больше всего вопросы. Thank you very much. Well, Евгений, you have the most questions and most comments. As for using soft power abroad, well, the the most important element of soft power is Vladimir Putin's figure, because his political leadership and his style set certain standards. And uh, recently I've read some research by our American colleagues and there was a poll in the military in the United States because they're concerned about the uh, growth and popularity of Putin uh, among the U.S. military. Of course, uh, we can see that among some liberal rhetorics, there is a person who stands for more traditional values. And maybe uh, Andre can also comment on that. that is I just uh, uh, looked uh, uh, into the data on the survey on Ukraine. So uh, leadership styles, again, uh, Putin won. So his style is very popular with uh, the people from different countries. Another important tool is the Russian system of mass media. Uh, RT, Russia Today, first of all. And the third point is just unconscious format. 
uh, which means Russian culture, Russian informational products. It just sets the tone, sets specific standards. But but uh, uh, we use it un, uh, subconsciously. But if we talk about uh, rational usage, uh, then we regularly hear criticisms because the quality of the Russian soft power is rather low. So it's a problem of the ideological crisis. Russia has uh, some discontent is it is uh, brewing has been brewing for some certain period of time and uh, President Putin expressed it in his Mun Munich speech so we are discontent we are not content but what are the values we want to convey uh, this here we have some difficulties Okay, Marat and Andrei. If we uh, if we talk about our region, Central Asia region, yes, we use this term Central Asia, uh, but we we uh, um, feel quite uh, comfortable with this term. Though uh, a large percentage of territory belongs geographically to Europe, but but we don't want to use the term the big Central Asia, which was coined by our big uh, our friend uh, Professor Frederick Starr, which was used by the U.S. diplomatic community in order to make us take care of Afghanistan. We do not want to do it. We cannot take care of it. So we prefer to work with Afghanistan at our own terms and conditions and in those areas where we uh, feel we can make the difference. We, we just don't want to uh, grant uh, humanitarian aid to the collapsed state. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to make uh, a focus on three points. The first, the change of generation, generational change we are talking about and we are analyzing a new typology of uh, leaders. And it relates not only to the post-Soviet space, uh, that the generation which was raised in our states, uh, national states, came to power. But uh, it just uh, the epoch by Mitterrand Kola and Gorbachev uh, changed by a new generation that was uh, raised in the conditions of a consumer society, the society of consumerism. So, and in some uh, societies, uh, there is still a traditional uh, uh, attitude uh, reigns. So that's why there is a conflict between these two uh, attitudes. It's actually a unique moment of global uh, revolution. Uh, so the old traditional and um, traditional politicians are replaced, are being replaced by young politicians. But my question is whether we should uh, somehow uh, f f uh, feed them and uh, raise them and breed them and educate them. So, you know, just uh, oh, if we just uh, 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 allow people from the street to to come to the power. Uh, it shows that uh, they these people do not have uh, a high professional level, do not belong to a system, and so uh, they just uh, camouflage with uh, technology, uh, uh, good uh, uh, slogans, and they are in power. Actually, this wave. Uh, just uh, so strong that we can't uh, stop it. 
We just use the, uh, as Aikido principle, use the principle of Aikido or uh, do as surfers do. As French elites understood that they cannot uh, reproduce, they just made an experiment with Macron as a populist politician. But this populist way is inevitable, but it will pass, and new leaders will uh, use these new populist tools. It, it's a new language. It's a language, a lingua franca, new Latin. But the problem is that still people should be professional and should uh, acquire uh, the required competences. So when this anti-establishment wave passes away, the, it should, uh, we should just uh, have to survive it and to uh, diminish the damage done it. So new people will come and they will have to acquire new communicative tools and uh, should be competent in terms of management and governance. They should know uh, what they are uh, governing or managing. Okay, three years ago, we even could not imagine that one of the uh, uh, core of the opposition would be lesbian feminists. But it's the reality we are uh, going through in 2019. Okay, so new European trends are uh, penetrating into the our new region space. So any short questions? Brief, just be brief. Belarus State University, Olga Lazurkina. I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Shibutov. You said that, uh, do I understand you correctly, that everything should be destroyed. So it means that you know how to build and who will be taken to our no, uh, to our uh, no ship. Uh, how can we no arc? How can we select uh, the people who would be invited to the ARC. So this question to Kazakhstan. What would be the uh, standards of selection or criteria of selection? Okay, Marat, the question is to you. So, okay. So we have uh, the... Uh, the organization, uh, Shanghai Organization of Corporations, and we'll see whom to choose. Uh, uh, so we have a, a bilateral contacts with Vietnam. So, so you just feel the difference. And, you know, new conditions prompt, uh, foster the development of trade. The same goes uh, in the relations with uh, Iran. Uh, actually, uh, one of the reasons for Maidan was the competition between the European Union and uh, the Russia's uh, Customs Union. Now, we just uh, uh, have to annul all the accords and agreements and then just resign them. So don't be worried. We have enough... Uh, uh, space for you. Okay, thank you very much. We have realized what principles you use. Now just a short question. Dear friends, uh, I believe you can keep talking on the sidelines. So you've been talking about a conflict in Donbass and unresolved conflict in the post-Soviet space as a consequence of uh, people 
uh, with a Soviet legacy to go over conflicts. But take a look at Cyprus or the European Union. Uh, they still cannot go through the crisis even though they don't have a Soviet legacy. So do you think the Soviet legacy uh, is actually the main factor that prevents people from getting over the conflict? Of course, uh, I wasn't talking about Soviet legacy mainly. On the one hand, in order to understand what we mean by social space, we need to take into account the gap between generations and uh, the differences within this generation. And we still have the generations that uh, were br brought uh, up in the Soviet civilization. But as for the conflict in the post-Soviet space, and as for the war in Ukraine, I believe that this is an event of a different scale that has to do with the lack of efficiency of states that were created in 1991. The internal inefficiency, high level of exploitation, uh, social conflicts uh, that then develop into ethnical and regional conflicts, and the inability to solve these conflicts, to settle these conflicts within the government is uh, one of the features uh, of the post-Soviet space. Uh, you mentioned the war in Donbass, and I believe this is a very sad example and a very sad test uh, to check if people can implement new practices of building trust and getting through conflicts. But instead of this, uh, we had uh, the false statements by the media, and uh, we are now just uh, trying to talk about global problems without having solved the problem that's right there, close to us, and that can impede development for decades. But I believe that we actually do have a chance. We have a new option of resetting relations in regional structures on the international level and uh, on the scale of the whole continent. And uh, I'm all for resetting these relations. And the last thing I want to say is that we need to build the new Helsinki process. We need to have a new OEC conference with inviting leaders from the whole continent. We need to talk more about security because such wars as wars in Ukraine are a very serious reason to discuss these issues. And uh, diplomats could be leaders. They could uh, role model this process. So uh, you ended at a very optimistic note. Uh, we have an opportunity, but the question is who's going to use it. And now the last comment. Uh, I want to say that the moderator is not only a person who announces the speakers, it's a person who can find a connection between the speakers and build them into one, to have an orchestra rather than people playing separate violins that uh, play a different melody. And that's why we need a moderator here. No one likes the moderator, but the orchestra cannot play without the moderator. And now I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Sushantov for some announcements. I'm very happy that uh, the anti-establishment wave uh, didn't crash our session. We are all very good with sticking to the time limit, and uh, um, I really love this metaphor. So two important announcements. First of all, lunch. We're going to have lunch just below us, uh, in the room just below us. You can just take the stairs. It's room 315, and there we're going to have lunch. And then immediately after lunch, we're starting at 210. We are going to have two parallel sessions. One of them is going to be here, and it's going to be dedicated to the international dimension of American domestic politics. And the second is going to be about the scenarios of politics in Europe. 
uh, in a room that's at the end of the, this corridor on the left and uh, you're going to see a sign. So 2.10, we're starting the next session and now enjoy your meal. Take your valu valuables with you.